everyone. Dave Landry here. This is Trading Simplified. This is a part of the show where I act surprised that <laughs> what episode we're on. We're on episode number 16. That just seems amazing because it's it's going by so quickly and I've really been enjoying it. I hope you've been enjoying it too. So what are we talking about? Well, I keep trying to get through these resolutions, but there's been so many great lessons as of late. So there's a few things I want to show you this week, but then want to really jump into those resolutions. And those lessons are the mystery chart follow-up, the missed the best of the worst trade of the week. And I have one which hopefully, and I know you're not supposed to use hope in this business, hopefully will be the best trade of the week. And then another one which was just uh, failed miserably. And we'll get to that in a lot of detail. Housekeeping, I do take requests. You have some questions, feel free to submit them. And in some cases, if they require a lot of thought, I'll either make that a show in and of itself or cover it outside of this particular venue. And if you did send in a question recently, didn't get an answer, check back with me and I'll see if um, I've already covered that. For more information, you go to davelander.com slash stock charts. You would, um, if you're watching the show live, give me a couple of hours to get my slides up there. But if you want the slides from the show and some follow-up information, I'd be happy to give you that. You could also reach me at davelander.com slash contact. All right, let's talk about the mystery chart. And the mystery chart from a couple of weeks back, we don't have a new one this week because there's no setups. Methodology requires a pullback. And if the market's making new highs, you're not gonna see a whole lot of setups. But we had, this is the actual setup that was in my trading service that I put out. And this is on a hypothetical 100K account, but I do run uh, an account, which I'm slowly becoming my model account, which has about that in it. And that's the trade right there. 600 CUE at 1632. And let's take a look at why I like the trade. Like I said, last week and weeks prior, the market was headed higher. Oh, this stock, I should say, was headed higher. And then we get accelerated higher and pull back. Now we had an entry here and a protective stop down here. So what has it done since? Well, since we put the trade on, it hasn't done a whole lot. So what do we do? Well, we do nothing, okay? And that's the hard part sometimes is to sit in a losing trade and some people call that dead money. Dead money has no chance of ever improving the position that is, but you don't know that. If you knew that, you'd own the world. So we just sit in a position until stopped out. And I was just looking over a second ago at the screens and it looks like it was doing okay today. So, so far so good. It looks like we're back in the plus column on that. Okay, let's talk about the missed trade, the best trade, or the worst trade. Well, this week I have the worst trade of the week and possibly the best trade of the week. And looks like right as I went live, this one's not doing so hot, but that's okay. What do we do? Well, nothing, unless we're stopped out. Anyway, th there's the trades down here on, like I said, let's say 100K, roughly 100K. You're looking at two 1,000 shares because two points risk. We risk two point was 2% per trade. And if you go in and watch the shows I've done on money management, that'll make a lot more sense. I also have complete modules just on money management, something I would strongly urge you to do. Now, in this particular case, we did hit the initial profit target. So I peeled off 500 shares. That was a trade I just showed for a profit of 990. We're looking for 1% or $1,000 in this particular case. And now all you have to do is relax. And I know, haha, right? Now, one thing interesting, we talked a little bit about this last week. It did require a little discretion because we had that big gap down last Monday. And it's not throwing caution to the wind because I'm going to show you one in a second, that gap down, and we actually had to get out of its way. But then it ran right back up. So from the peak to trough on the remaining position, you were down 13, 15, and then the swing back up was 16, 15. And it looks like this is going to be some gyrations, obviously, today along with that. And we'll follow up with that on in existing shows or in future shows, I should say. It's interesting. Whenever I speak in person, a lot of times, especially when I get the money management, I'm like, I'm going to show you guys something you've never seen. And everybody gets all excited and people wake up from their naps. And, and then I show them a losing trade and they can't believe that I, a guy actually showed a losing trade. Well, we've been on quite a roll here since we started this show or since I was asked to join uh, StockCharts.com. And I do want to show you that sometimes it, it just flat out doesn't work. And this was a trade here. It had a nice run from lows. And I'll zoom that chart in in just one second, a little bit 
of a pullback. This is SNDL, Sundial Growers, one of those weed stocks. And initially it took off and looked pretty good. Our buy was right here and we were feeling, feeling pretty good about the trade. It's a little bit easier to see when we zoom in. That's about a 70% run there followed by a pullback, a little bit of a shallow pullback, but when you have a stock coming off of major lows like this, in this particular case, all-time lows, I call that a Phoenix strategy. And if you go back and watch the shows we did on emerging trends, that'll make a little bit more sense too. So we don't have the luxury of waiting around for that deeper pullback. Stock initially takes off, our buy was here, initially takes off. And within a few days, we're up 1560 and we're feeling good pretty good, or it's a weed stock, we might look a little bit more like this, but you get the idea. So, so far so good, decent trade. Unfortunately though, we're looking for a 2% move, which would mean a $2,000 open profit per 100K and we take 100K off and we didn't quite get there in this particular case. And then the stock began to implode and we had the gap lower. And at that point I'm like, mother, father you ever notice those coaches on the sidelines when the ref blows a call or something there something about their mother and father i'm wondering what they're saying but anyway i picked that up from them and what i did was this gap through the stop so i wanted to see if it would reverse in early trading that's called an opening gap reversal and that's a damage control technique sometimes you lose more than you intend and sometimes the stock comes right back and you do pretty good. In some particular cases, you'll end up staying with the position. In this particular case, I had to get out of the way. The old hedge fund adage, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. And you can see that's a trade pretty ugly, especially on a percentage basis. On a monetary basis, it was a loss of 2662. The most I ever want to lose, ideally, per trade, would be 2,000 per 100K or 2% per trade. And that's if stopped out. So that's the ideal max loss. All right, I've been threatening to finish these trading resolutions for quite some time. So let's, let's see how many we can get through. And the reason it's taken us so long, not because I keep stopping to talk about other things, which I have been, but uh, is because each one of these could be a show in and of itself. And over the years, and I was surprised at how many of them, I think I did 200 and I might've done, don't quote me on this, but 300 webinars that are on YouTube. and. Many of those webinars cover this topic of different trading resolutions. So each one, what I'm trying to say is each one could be a complete show in and of itself and often is. Now, I've said this joke about six times so far because we keep trying to get through these <laughs> trading resolutions. But again, if you're looking for excitement entertainment, you need to seek that outside of the market. The market is a very expensive place to look as I made the joke the past several weeks. If you want excitement, have an affair, that way you only lose half of your money. But all kidding aside, it's a very expensive place to look for excitement. Now, what I have found is that busy people make good traders. They're not sitting around firing off day trades because they're bored. And one example that I often give is one of my clients who's pretty good. He does really well and then he does so-so for a while then is really well. Well, all of a sudden he started doing really well again. I said, well, are you on one of your cycles? He says, no, uh, my trading has gotten a lot better because one of my doctors quit and now I'm literally working day and night. I have to cover her shift in the hospital until we could find another doctor. So he didn't have time to fire off unnecessary day trades. He was just simply too busy. So I often say busy traders make good traders. People often ask me, hey, Dave, I've got this crazy busy job. I'd like to trade, can I trade with your methodology? And my answer is absolutely. It takes a few minutes to place the orders. I mean, I'm guilty of watching the screen too much, but you really don't have to watch the screen that much, usually around the open in case there's a little discretion necessary. Then you can go off and save lives and prepare transmissions and do other great things. So I am here at dust to dawn, but I'm not trading like a crazy man. I'm not like the little rat hitting the button for the cocaine in and out, in and out all day long. My ideal holding period, I was thinking about this before we went live, when people say, what's your, hot, what's your holding period? My holding period, ideally, would be 10 years or longer. When I get in a trade, I want to be in it for a long, long, long time. But obviously, the money management takes me out more sooner. Now, the more you observe, the, the more likely you are to make an unnecessary trade. 
And I don't want to get too deep into it or, or we'll never get through all these slides, but there's definitely uh, a deep seated psychology and even a neurology involved with that. And you could easily put yourself into a state of regret. So the bottom line is, and it's cliche, is you have to plan that trade and then you have to trade that plan. So plan your trade and then trade the plan. A lot easier said than done, but if you have a stop in place, where are you gonna get out? No questions asked. If you have a profit target, where are you gonna take half your profits? No questions asked, okay? And then you're gonna trail your stop and you have some rules on that. Then there's nothing left to chance. Watching that screen does not help. And then the worst thing you do is micromanage yourself. And this is something that I preach about quite often is be careful not to mind micromanage. The old saying, be as close to the market as you need to be, but no closer. And in an ideal world, even when I'm doing these day trades, which I, I don't do that often, I've got two on today and that's just because everything's set up. I do these opening gap reversal trades. We talked about that in last week's presentation and presentations prior. I will occasionally do those. I, I kind of see them, they can be a gift horse, not so much today, but sometimes you come in, if you're just getting whacked, like I think it was uh, Monday before last, it's just, you. it's like the Jimmy Rogers walk over there and pick the money up, money line in the corner, walk over and pick it up from market wizards. But even on those intraday trades, I do have a point, believe it or not, is that Ideally, I want that to get to that initial profit target as soon as possible, and I'll let an automated trailing stop stop me out, and I'll go off to the gym or wherever. I know you're probably laughing. I, I do occasionally go to the gym, believe it or not. All right, number 12, I'll accept what the market is willing to give. It's the old adage, those of you kids, you get what you get, and you don't throw a fit. The problem that a lot of people have, especially successful people, is your success was brought about by having a high degree of control. You control the situation and that makes your success. Unfortunately, in trading, you have none. The serenity prayer comes to life. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, the wisdom to know the difference. I wish I knew the pearl. There's a pearls before swine that that's worth Googling on that. It's called the genius prayer. And it's, it's pretty funny. I wish I'd have thought about it before, um, before going live today, but you'll have to see it. I've done it in quite a few presentations. Number 13, and this is a biggie. I will do an honest postmortem on every trade, which is not to be confused with a post Malone. That's something completely different. One of my clients actually sent me a post Malone <laughs> shirt. I wear it all the time. Like you're in the post, it's like, ah, it's a long story. Some post is okay though, though, I suppose. Did you really pick the best and leave the rest? Now, when I spoke in San Francisco, I think that's the last time I got out the house to go somewhere. And I spoke at the TSA, uh, TSAASF conference, annual conference. And I talked a little bit about postmortems and I kind of glossed over it a little bit, just thinking that everybody like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker, everybody knew that. And a couple of the attendees really wanted me to get into it a, a little bit more deeper. So this is something I've been working more and more on lately. And the postmortem is you go back and you look at that trade, you back the chart all the way back out to the day you got in the trade and you look at it and say, if I saw this same trade again, would I take it? And you just kind of analyze it. The I think the, the better traders out there are constantly striving to get better and they're constantly looking at what they did wrong, what they could have done better. And then the those who are the, the charlatan type are gonna brag to you about all these great trades that they've done. And they're not gonna focus on the fact that you can occasionally lose money and what you could do to become better. So you have to really truly ask yourself, and this is a brutally honest thing to do. Did you really pick the best and leave the rest? Now you have to work hard to separate luck from skill. I've done quite a few presentations on this and Annie Duke wrote an excellent book. And if you go to my website, daylearner.com slash books dash two dash read, I have a list of books I would recommend that you read. And her book was called Thinking in Bets. And she talks a lot about the separating of luck from skill. The aforementioned uh, thing I talked about where good traders are always looking to figure out what they could have done better. 
And then the bad traders are always bragging. She talked about the poker players at the bar, the ones that win and brag about it or are not the most successful. The most successful are those who win and then kind of beat themselves up a little bit because they could have done better. And it's really hard to separate the luck from skill. And as I often preach, and as I'm going to say in a few minutes, the market can be a really bad teacher. Now, when you're doing your post-mortem, early in the process, if you reach a point where you're thinking, what in the hell was I thinking on this trade? That's great. It means that you're on your way. Even better is, well, in hindsight, I just got lucky on that one. You know that it wasn't necessarily trending. It wasn't the best stock. It wasn't the best setup that you could have found especially if you really take some time and go look at some other setups and other stocks and perfect hindsight, of course. And that's part of all this is considered deliberate practice and something that's been a lot, a lot of time talking about when we talk about psychology. Now, if you get to the point where, and this is kind of like the true enlightenment and believe me, you're still going to drop an F bomb. But if you look at the screen and say, well, I lost, but if I saw that same setup, today or tomorrow, I should say, I would take it in a heartbeat. And that's when I think you, it begins to gel and you realize that, hey, you know, sometimes it doesn't work, but I picked the best going in and I need to reward myself for that good behavior, not on whether or not I made money. Terrence on Dean once said that outcomes are noisy and that bad trades can have good outcomes and good trades can have bad outcomes. And if there is one secret to trading is figuring out how to separate that luck from skill. Now, as I alluded to a second ago, I will reward myself for following the process regardless of the outcome. As I said a minute ago, the market could be a really bad teacher and can often reward bad behavior. Number 15, and this is a biggie. It goes hand in hand, sort of dovetails in with the post-mortem. I will hold myself accountable for my actions. And this is tough, especially when you're by yourself, like I am here doing my own trades, I could do a lot of bad trading and sweep it under the rug, rug and no one will ever know. So holding yourself accountable is really tough. What I would urge you to do is hold yourself accountable to someone else. And I'll give you an example. One client does well for a while, then kind of blows up and rinse and repeat. And I told him, I said, look, what if you showed your wife my trading plan, my trading service, and showed her your trading plan and how are you going to follow your plan and where are you going to get in? And like this Dave Landry guy, he's not always right, but he's kind of got an idea how markets work and I kind of understand what he's doing. And I'm going to use some of his trades and pick some of my trades and here's the plan, yada, 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 and show your wife. And if things don't work out, explain to her, well, it didn't work out. Sometimes they don't work out. It happens, spelled with a silent S-H, and so on and so forth. And he says, oh, no, 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 that would end the marriage. So your spouse might not be the best person to get involved with your trading. Oh, although I will tell you this, in a book, one of those little behavior finance books, it might even be called the Little Behavior Finance Book, Montier said that he referenced a study where men who got women involved with their trading, their trading actually improved. And unfortunately, the vice versa happened. Women who got their husbands involved with their trading, their trading actually got worse because we as dudes have an ego. Somebody a while back, hedge fund manager, got in hot water saying that women were too emotional for trading. And I've only seen really one or two cases in 20-something years of doing this. Shoot, oh, 30, geez where these women just, just blew up and, and really didn't follow the system and didn't really do what they should do. But for the most part, I find the women that I work with do a lot better than the men. And that's because I think their fear of losing money and the money management comes in a lot better as opposed to the ego-driven male. But that's a, another presentation in and of itself. Number 16, I will embrace my emotion. I use the word embrace on, on purpose. About seven years ago, I was speaking, once again, yeah, it's TSAAF. Every six or seven years, I guess that would invite me back. So 
looking forward to what 2027 now or whatever. <laughs> anyway, there Denise Shell spoke and she was explaining that you cannot eliminate emotions from your decision. So every decision has emotions and stress. And Descartes has also written about this quite a bit. His book, I think, is Descartes' Era. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I forget the exact name of it, but if you Google Descartes, you should be able to find it. Anyway, every decision has emotions and stress. If you did not have any emotions or stress involved with the decision, you'd be dead in a day. And that's the neurology of it. Everything has to have a consequence. And it that goes down to the smallest decision as, for instance, what are you going to eat for lunch today? So you have to embrace the fact that there is a consequence with every decision and there is emotions with every decision. You just have to learn how to embrace those emotions. Number 17, I will keep a journal of my trading actions and my feelings. Now, brokerages do a pretty good job of tracking your trades. Earlier, you could see me, if you were uh, watching the pre-show, I guess. <laughs> I guess only producers could see that, but I kept pulling the curtain back because my trading station is over there. And, uh, you know, tracking the trades is one thing. The broker will do a pretty good job that for you. So I was watching the, my little PL go up and down before the show. Do as I say, not as I do, right? But the bottom line is you can track your trades in your journal, and that's important. But more important, you want to track your emotions. And last December, not this recent one, but the one prior, I was speaking in St. Lucia at Charlie Kirk's retreat for traders. And one of the guys said that he had a confession journal. His name was Casey. And he talked about whenever he did something he's not supposed to do, he actually wrote it down in a confession journal. So track your emotions as much or more as you're tracking your trades. And that's a very smart thing to do. Now, along the lines of emotions, L.R. Thomas once said, and I've seen it from other people, but I'll give her credit because this is the first time I saw it was from her. Don't expect trading to fill a hole in your life that's missing. And there's always going to be a hole in your life. And that hole sort of moves. I know it's kind of a bizarre thing to say, but you're always going to have a problem. You're always going to have an expense and the thing to remember is that your trading will spill over into your life. I'm not, I'm a very emotional person, and my wife knows when I'm having a really bad day. I kind of snap at her a little bit. And on a good days, obviously, I can't mess my emotions very well. I feel pretty good about things. But you have to be really, really careful not to expect trading to fill that hole in your life is that's missing. And you can get into a lot of trouble. One thing I often say is I will believe in what I see and not in what I believe. And that's number 18 for the trading resolutions. And what I'm saying there is there's only three states in which a market can exist. It's either an uptrend which would mean demand. It's either in a downtrend, which would mean supply. I was talking to my daughter yesterday. We are talking about school and stuff, and she's since graduated, but economics really threw her a loop. And I'm like, bring me your textbook. I could figure it out. I, you know, I'm pretty smart. I got an MBA, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so I look at a textbook. I'm like, what the hell are they saying? Basically, this is economics right here. This is all you need to know about economics. And that's 90% of what you need to know about trading. And I guess the other half to make a yogiism would be psychology. Now, what happens if demand equals supply? Well, that means that the market is going sideways. Ideally, you wanna be long and buying stocks when there's demand. You want to be out of and possibly shorting stocks when there's supply and you want to be sitting on your hands when supply equals demand. Supply equals demand. So you have to always ask yourself, which is it? And more often than not, it's not going to be doing what you want it to do, the market that is. But unless you're 
Bill Clinton, you have to realize what is, is. All right, number 19. I will read my three by five trading card before each and every trade. So I came up with this little card and I actually use it as a bookmark in my trading journal. This is my actual trading journal there. I, Dave Landry, will take the best ogre and trend trades. Ogre is opening gap reversal. And we talked about that quite a bit in prior shows. And I may do a show just on trading those in upcoming weeks. Even if this means passing on okay opportunities and watching them occasionally take off without me. Trading like life is making decisions and living with them. I often joke at my wife's expense, making decisions is easy, living with them is not. Making the decision to marry the most beautiful woman I ever met was an easy decision. Living with her is not. So all kidding aside, you have to be willing to live with your decisions. And that means that occasionally you're going to have to watch a stock take off without you. But if it was a mediocre opportunity or you didn't have a setup to begin with, then you just have to let it go. All right, so as I mentioned a minute ago, there's a neurology involved with all this. And about six or seven years ago, after attending the conference where Denise Shaw was speaking, and she talked about the neurology of not being able to make decisions. Well, I did a lot of research on that, and that's down in your very emotional part of your brain called the amygdala, and that's the so-called lizard brain, and that actually would be right underneath, that's the top of your brain stem. That would be right underneath the rest of what's sloshing around up there, which is on your left here. So you have to be careful not to let that little emotional part of your brain take over. And that little emotional part of your brain is very necessary. In fact, I was just recently reading where it perceives everything as a threat. And it does that to keep you alive. The rest of what's sloshing up around up there makes you, you. Now, the amygdala and limbic system and lizard brain, whatever you want to call all that stuff, makes you do stupid stuff. And the rest of what's sloshing around up there keeps you from doing stupid stuff, okay? Now, here's the little trick that you need to know. How long does it take to get from that amygdala to, again, the rest of what's sloshing around up there? Well, actually, it only takes two to three seconds. And if you could just take a little bit of a pause and do something as simply as reading a little three by five card before every trade, that's gonna slow you down. Now, if you wanna make a big change in your life, the best thing you could do is make a small change. And I have these friends and they're always on a triannual diet and they show up and they're miserable to be around. And then we see them parting like rock stars soon thereafter on Facebook. And the reason is, and they end up fatter in the end, is because they make these drastic changes and your body will resist those drastic changes. And number 20, I will go to this big old long URL, print this article off and refer to it often in 2020. Hey, we finally got through all these things. So I wanna thank you guys and girls for watching. Again, may the trend be with you. If you need to follow up on anything here, davelander.com slash stock charts, I'll give you the slides and a plethora of information. And if you need to contact me directly, davelander.com slash contact. Thank you so much. And may the trend be with you.